We're going to continue our talk on the pathology of blood. Recall a lot of pathology we find is due to the abnormal proliferation of cell types. We talked about histiocytosis and plasma cell disorders in the last video. Um, histiocytes, if you recall, come from the myeloid lineage. Is that correct? So in this video, we're going to talk about the other cells of the myeloid lineage, and we call that myeloproliferative disorders. Fitting name? Milo from the myeloid lineage, proliferative meaning proliferative disorders. Now your lymphoid lineage can have disorders too and you can have increased lymphoid cells. We talked about one of them, um, plasma cells is a lymphoid cell, so multiple myelomas. You can also have lymphocytic leukemias and lymphocytic lymphomas. But for this video, we're gonna talk about myeloproliferative. And when you have a lot of these cells, you're increased risk of myeloid cancers like myeloid leukemias and myeloid lymphomas, but that's a, that's a topic for another time. Instead, we're just gonna talk about the proliferation of the different types of cells of the myeloid lineage. How about increased red blood cells? What do we call that? We call that polycythemia vera. You can also have increased uh, megakaryocytes. Those are things that create platelets. So you can have increased platelets. So I'll say increased platelets. We call that essential thrombocythemia. Thrombo, another word for platelets is thrombocytes. That's why we call it thrombocythemia. Uh, don't get confused with the nomenclature. Thrombocytes just means platelets. We can also have a special disorder called myeloid metaplasia with myelofibrosis. That's a bit more complicated. I'll dedicate a little more time on this one. And then lastly, chronic myeloid leukemia falls under this category. And that I'm going to talk about when we talk about our leukemia block, we just know it falls under this category. So I'll just kind of exclude it. It's still in this category, but we're going to talk about it in a subsequent video. Know that these three are highly associated with a genetic mutation, and that mutation is called V617 mutation of the JAK2. What the heck does that mean? JAK, or I'll write it down here, Janus. Kinase is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. You remember your tyrosine kinase uh, helps uh, cell signals. So non-receptor just means some tyrosine kinases are on the cell cell surface. Those are receptors, and then non ones are just in the cytoplasm. So this is a tyrosine kinase that's in the cytoplasm, and what the Janus kinase does is it helps cell signaling, so it helps cell proliferation. And when you have a mutation in that, especially a V617, that just means at the 617 spot of that, that gene or that protein, valine is changed for phenylalanine, that's what that means. If you have that mutation, then your Janus kinase goes haywire and you have an abnormal proliferation, and that's how you get your myeloproliferative diseases. So these three are linked to this mutation. Know that well. Jack 2 mutations. I've seen questions that are a little bit, um, I guess, tricky. They'll talk about myeloproliferative disorders and then say what kind of genetic mutation do they have? And you'll look down and look for Jack 2 kinase and it won't be there instead of, it'll be like receptor tyrosine kinase or non-receptor tyrosine kinase, etc., etc. Just recall that Janus kinase is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. That's something, that's like a, a easy way to trick you. You know, they just take us one step further and they can catch a lot of students. So just know that those are your myeloproliferative disorders. Let's kind of look at them in a little more detail. And I'll start with polycythemia vera. So let me clear the board. Polycyth polycythemia vera, you're going to have increased red blood cells. So you're going to have increased hematocrit. That's, that just sees what percentage of your blood is red blood cells. So you're going to have increased hematocrit. You're also, however, Gonna have an increase in white blood cells, platelets. You're gonna have an increase in a lot of things. That's why they call it poly 
cythemia and not just like erythrocythemia. So that's the poly part of the name. However, the, the main player is going to be your red blood cells. What does the vera part of the name mean? What does polycythemia cythemia vera mean? Vera means true. So polycythemia means true polycythemia. That means that increased red blood cell is from an abnormal proliferation, either from the JAX2 mutation or what have you. It's from that and nothing else. So you have to distinguish polycythemia vera from other increases of red blood cells. And I'll tell you one of the big ways we can increase red blood cells. Naturally, we have a hormone called EPO, which is made in your kidneys, and that increases red blood cells. That's a normal response if you're, um, if you're in a high altitude and you need more red blood cells. So I'll write high altitude, or you have CVS problems or lung problems, chronic lung problems, or you're having chronic hypoxemia. So I'll write lung problems, lung path. All these can increase EPO and increase red blood cells because you need it. That's, that's normal, that's physiological. Another, I guess, abnormal cause of increased EPO would be in cancer. So if you have cancers that secrete EPO, a renal cell carcinoma is a big one, which shouldn't surprise you because EPO comes from your kidneys. Hepatocellular carcinoma, all these can cause it. And all right, cancers increase EPO. But this, this EPO pathway we call secondary polycythemia. It's not due to just the abnormal proliferation of cells. There's, a, there's an underlying mechanism. So that's secondary polycythemia. And one more cause of polycythemia is relative polycythemia. So right, relative. And that doesn't mean your cousin has polycythemia. Relative polycythemia means that you, your plasma deleted, you're dehydrated. You've, you've kind of reduced the liquid in your blood. And because of that, it looks like you have increased red blood cells relative to, you know, if you're well hydrated. So I'll say decrease volume, like in dehydration, can make it look like you have increased red blood cells. So it looks like increased red blood cells. That's why we call it polycythemia vera, or true polycythemia, because we want to separate that from everything else. We can separate them just by knowing the mechanism, but, but you should also know how to separate them by lab values. So in normal polycythemia vera, you're gonna have increased red blood cells. I'll write that it is EPO independent. Doesn't use that pathway, again. Because it's not using EPO, because it's not due to like high altitude or hypoxemia, your oxygen set, it's going to be normal. And because you have increased red blood cells, you're actually going to negatively feedback on EPO. Your body's going to realize you have too much red blood cells and you're going to actually see a decrease EPO. This is all primary polycythemia vera. Where are the lab findings of secondary polycythemia? Well, because it's due to increased EPO, we call this the EPO dependent pathway increase EPO. And if it's due to the high altitude or lung pathology, you're going to have decrease O2 sat. That's what causes the EPO in the first place. If it's due to cancer, then there's nothing wrong with your lungs. So you're going to have normal O2 sat. That's secondary polycythemia. Relative, you're going to have normal sat you're gonna have normal EPO, normal everything. It's basically just your fluid depleted. And one of the signs on bloods you can find is normal blood mass. Blood mass calculates how many red blood cells are in the blood because it's normal because it's not due to a proliferation, it's due to volume depletion, okay? So just to recap, the first thing you do when you see polycythemia is that you, you look for EPO. If it's normal, it's usually just relative. They'll give you a history of someone see who's dehydrated or volume depleted. If it's high, you're thinking of secondary. You're thinking of EPO-dependent pathways. And then you just have to look at the O2 sat. If it's low, it's in high altitude and lung pathology. That's what's causing the raised EPO. If it's a normal O2 sat, then the cancer is causing the EPO. 
And then if you have a low EPO, then that's just regular polycythemia. That is polycythemia lab-wise. We talked so much about the lab, we didn't even talk about the symptoms of polycythemia. Polycythemia symptoms have to deal heavily with the increased viscosity of blood. So you're gonna have hyper viscosity. You're gonna have this reddish face just due from the congestion of blood. So red face, you can have red extremities, extremities. You can have engorgement of your spleen, so splenomegaly. You can have thrombotic events just from the clogging. So those are your strokes, your MIs, and it's actually, polycythemia is actually the most common cause of bud chiari. That's the thrombosis of your hepatic vein. And from that you get this, you get ascites, you get this big belly, you get these descended veins around your abdomen. That's bud chiari, so all right, hepatic vein. But it could be anything. You can have dural sinus thrombosis, which sounds fancy and kind of throws you off your game. But that's just that's just a thrombosis. I guess they got sick and tired of saying like strokes and MIs. So they start naming random thrombosis. So just know your increased risk of thrombotic events, your increased risk of gout because of cell turnover and cell destruction. You just have increased uric acid. So gout is a big one. And then generalized pruritus. Very few things cause generalized pruritus or scratching or itching. And this is one of them. The other one is uh, cholestasis of your gallbladder can cause it because of the increase of bile acids and waste products. But this is another big one. Not due to red blood cells, but increased cells of other cells like your, like your mast cells. And they release histamine. And uh, the common question is someone will take a shower and every time they shower, they'll start itching because their histamines degranulate, whether it's too hot or too cold, they'll start itching after the shower. Generalized itching. And that is a big sign of polycythemia. Okay? So pruritus from mast cells. How do you treat it? First line is phlebotomy. Phlebotomy, which is bloodletting, basically. You just drain the blood. That makes sense. That shouldn't surprise you because you're because the symptoms are from too much blood, you wanna drain the blood and you're aiming for a hematocrit under 45%. You can also give drugs like aspirin to try and thin out the blood. You can give drugs like hydroxyurea. What is hydroxyurea? Hydroxyurea blocks ribonucleotide reductase. This is an enzyme that helps you form deoxy ribonucleotides, which is, is DNA. So if you can't form DNA, then your cells can't, can't uh, replicate and proliferate. That basically blocks proliferation. You can also give them interferon alpha. Interferon is a cytokine. And interferon, again, either directly inhibits proliferation or it induces immune cells to attack abnormal cells. Which is good, but because you're causing increased destruction, it also increases the risk of the gout and cell turnover. Those are your drugs. Uh, and phlebotomy is, again, the first line choice. That is polycythemia vera. The next on the list, which I've erased, is going to be essential thrombocythemia. That, again, is due to increased platelets. And there's a lot of reasons why you might have increased platelets. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Where you ruled everything out and this patient just keeps having elevated platelets. So we're talking about like 450K for at least two months. And after you ruled everything out and they just have this elevated um, sustained level of playlist and you can then you can call it essential thrombocythemia can be mild can be more severe um, some symptoms include bleeding which seems counterintuitive because you have increased platelets you should stop bleeding but those platelets aren't very functional so you can see bleeding how do we treat it we can give our hydroxyurea and our and our inf alphas or we can just take the platelets out through platelet phoresis as essential thrombocythemia. Nice and quick, easy one. 
The last one is your myeloid metaplasia with myelofibrosis. That's quite a name. I'm just gonna call it MMM. Not to be confused with multiple myeloma, it has an extra M in it. So MMM. This is due to increase in cells, especially mega karyocytes. And those are the cells that make platelets. So these are somewhat similar in that regards. What makes it different is that these mega karyocytes really, really produce a ton of cytokines and namely fibro blast growth factors and they recruit fibroblasts into the bone marrow and those fibroblasts do what fibroblasts do they cause fibrosis cause collagen deposition so fibrosis and when it becomes fibrosis it can't really function anymore so you get pancytopenia basically no cells in your blood because it's just all fibrosis when your body senses this it starts to move blood production elsewhere. We call that extra medullary hematopoiesis or extra medullary hematopoiesis to try and compensate for that loss of um, production. Now these can occur everywhere. It can call, occur in your liver, your spleen, your cirrhosis surface. Um, this shouldn't surprise you because when you're an embryo, those are your first sites of blood blood production. You don't develop your bones until way later. So uh, your body senses this and then your spleen and your liver, you know, wake back up and say, oh no, we're out of blood. We're going to have to start making it on our own. One of the most common sites is going to be your spleen. So splenomegaly is common. In fact, one of the most common causes of splenomegaly in an older patient is myelofibrosis. Okay. So splenomegaly is common. And with that, you get left upper quadrant pain where your spleen is. Now I want to talk about some blood findings because that's what you should do if a patient, older patient comes in with a lower upper quadrant pain and has a big spleen. You want to do some investigation, so blood findings. You're going to see teardrop red blood cells that literally look like a teardrop. And they look like that because of red blood cells when they're leaving the, the bone marrow because it's so fibrosis, they basically get squeezed into oblivion. So you get these teardrop red blood cells. You're going to see anemia. There's a special word for it called leukoerythroblastic anemia. This is just anemia due to the replacement of bone marrow by some sort of space occupying lesion where you destroy that bone marrow and then now you, you're having anemia because you can no longer make red blood cells. So you have anemia. And you have a dry bone tap. So if you try and aspirate the bone marrow and try and see what you get, you're gonna have a dry bone marrow. You might as well aspirate a rock because it's nothing but fibrosis. They might call it hypocellular. I've seen it called that a few times on questions. Just basically means there's nothing there. It's, they might just call it dry. And that's very characteristic of myelofibrosis. Yeah, your bone marrow is just shot. What's the treatment? You're going to need stem cell replacement or bone marrow replacement. So stem cell, bone marrow, and then the usual hydroxyurea, INF. And if the enlarged spleen gets too problematic, then a splenectomy may be warranted. Those are your myeloproliferative disorders. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.